Everybody, welcome aboard. This is John Sovak. I am your OutTalk host and moderator today, and I'm so excited to have you all joining us. And I'm really excited about the panel we have today to talk about the intersectionality of care in the LGBTQIA plus community. Um, first of all, I just want to wish you all a happy Black History Month. We at OutCare Health all celebrate the resilience, the contributions, and the history within the Black community, and really celebrate and recognize the intersectionality of care and it was a unique journey to be embraced and supported. Um, if you didn't get enough yet love yesterday for Valentine's Day, we invite you to join the Outcare Health family in Los Angeles on February 26th for an Allies After Hour Mixer. Um, it's gonna be fun, it's gonna be cool. You're gonna get to meet some of the faces behind Outcare Health. And it's uh, really gonna bring everyone together, professionals, allies, partners, providers, for some connections and some conversations. And it's a benefit to raise support for Outcare Health. Um, so we'd love to see you there if you're in the area and want to stop by. Also, vote, don't forget to sign up for Outcare Health support groups um, next month. We have a Latinx, so gender diverse communities, LGBTQ uh, Black communities. And you can find out more about all of these support groups online at outcarehealth.org slash outreach. So please, we'd love to have you join us and be part of that conversation as well. So with that said, I am so honored to have our panel here today, and I would love to give them a chance to introduce themselves, uh, share a little bit about who they are and the work that they do, and they get a bonus question that they are just hearing right now for the very first time. Okay, at the end of our conversation today, you are given a free plane ticket to fly anywhere in the world where would you want to go? Okay, so with that said, I think I'm gonna to toss it over to Monica, just maybe a little introduction about yourself and then let's see where you're gonna to travel to. Okay, well, good evening, everyone. I'm just delighted to be here. I'm Monica Webb Hooper. I serve as Deputy Director of the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities, which is one of the 27 institutes and centers at the National Institutes of Health. And I'm a clinical health psychologist by training. Before I joined the federal government in this capacity, I was a tenured professor working and uh, conducting clinical research on health behavior change with a tremendous focus on addressing health disparities, mostly work in tobacco cessation, weight management, um, across a variety of underserved populations. So I'm really delighted to be here. And then the, I need to answer the question now. You do. I've given you your plane ticket. <laughs> when we're done, you get to fly anywhere in the world. Where are you going? The first thing that came to mind was that I was going to Fiji. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm going on vacation and just going to completely unwind and enjoy the beautiful beach and the people and the surroundings. I love it. I'll join you there. That's what a lot of sunscreen. <laughs> so, Rohini, maybe you could introduce yourself next. Definitely. My name is Rohini, um, and I'm the current president of American Medical Student Association, or AMSA. Um, and I'm also a recent medical um, grad, medical school graduate in May of 2023, and I've currently um, applied for OBGYN residencies. Um, I'm, I've been passionate about reproductive health issues and policies ranging from uh, anti-human trafficking efforts to advocacy around abortion access and affirming care for LGBTQ plus individuals. Um, I'm also very passionate about working on medical education reform, um, especially in trauma-informed care and interventions and public health policies. Um, and for the flight ticket, I always wanted to go to Greece, and thankfully I did that uh, the summer, and now I really want to go to Thailand, and that's my next destination. <laughs> nice. Chris, can you get on that? <laughs> and finally, Leah. Hi, everyone. My name is Leah Smith, and I am the Associate Director of the National Center for Disability, Equity, and Intersectionality. So we look at um, inequities facing uh, people with disabilities in uh, healthcare, community living, and justice. So that's our area. Um, and where am I going? Greece, for sure. That's where I'm headed. Oh, I like it. Nice. So once again, my name is John Sovak, and I'm a therapist here in Pasadena, California. I'm also the author of Out, A Parent's Guide to Supporting Your LGBTQIA Plus Kid Through Coming Out and Beyond. And I travel all over the country and speak all over the world, actually, about creating affirming spaces for LGBTQ people in care. 
And if I had a ticket, I think I want to go to Scotland this time. Um, my husband and I took a trip to the UK recently, got in a car, drove around Wales for three weeks. And it was amazing. So now we want to do that same thing in Scotland. So that's where I would be headed. <clears throat> so I think, you know, this is a really dense topic we're bringing to the forefront today. And maybe one of the places for us to be able to step into this is really like together create an understanding of, well, how do differences in race and gender and ethnicity and sexual orientation and age and, and ability and socioeconomic, how did these things show up and maybe influence and affect a person's experience in receiving care? I know it's kind of a big bucket to start in, but I think it's a really good foundation piece for maybe us to speak about. And Rohini, I've seen kind of a nice nod from you. So I'm gonna hand this one off to you to start if you're okay. Definitely, yeah. I, I mean, this is intersectionality and it it plays such a huge role from health for health outcomes for all the experiences uh, that are influenced by all these combination of factors, including social determinants of health, the systemic inequalities and the individual identities that we see. We see it in access to healthcare. It affects individuals' access to healthcare services based on all of these different factors. We see healthcare disparities, um, especially when it comes to differences in health outcomes between different population groups. Uh, we know that, for example, Black women are experiencing higher rates of maternal mortality compared to white women. Um, and it's a combination of racial discrimination, gender bias, socioeconomic factors um, that affect prenatal care, care quality of maternal uh, mater maternity services. Um, I mean, the quality of care is a huge one um, that there's such a difference within the healthcare system on uh, who receives the best care. And patients with intersecting marginalized identities, they definitely experience discrimination, bias, microaggressions uh, from healthcare providers, and that negatively impacts their healthcare outcomes and their experiences of care. Um, and I mean, there's so many things, even patient provider relationships uh, are, are huge and that, having that open communications. So I think it's very important for healthcare providers to recognize and address these intersecting identities and experiences of their patients to be able to provide that effective and patient-centered care that respects the patient's values, their preferences, their lived experiences. And yeah, those are just such, such important things for us to consider when when we're providing that kind of healthcare services. Mm -hmm. Monica, your thoughts? I think that that was a really great response. I mean, if I thought of, if I think about the buckets that, you know, you see uh, tremendous differences in how these various identity factors affect people, they would largely be what, what you've heard, access to healthcare services. There are economic barriers. There are certainly lots of cultural differences. There are structural biases that really can hinder just access to health care for various groups that experience health disparities. Um, I think the quality of care is, is a big one. You know, stereotypes, prejudices can certainly affect the quality of care. Sometimes these might be implicit biases and sometimes they may be explicit biases, but certainly um, we know that they're largely associated with disparities in treatment and outcomes. Um, on the patient provider or clinician communication piece, I think cultural and language differences can lead to real significant misunderstandings between patients and their healthcare providers, which of course affects the, the care and the quality and its effectiveness. And the last one I would I'd probably add that might be a little different is health literacy um, can certainly be affected. Things like socioeconomic status, income education level, exposures to health information can really impact a person's ability to understand health information, which can also affect health outcomes. Mm -hmm. Leah, your thoughts? Yeah, I just want to add, I mean, I think uh, both Monica and Rohini really uh, nailed it. I, I think from a disability perspective, we um, see these things playing out not only, I mean, I think healthcare can be really broadly defined and also include housing and transportation and food access and some of these uh, broader systemic issues. Um, if we don't have transportation, we can't get to healthcare um, and things like that. But also um, when we're talking about healthcare, are we including people with disabilities at the table? Are we, um, is the, 
Is the scale accessible? Can someone in a wheelchair uh, use it? Are the tables, the exam tables accessible? These are all things that um, need to be part of this conversation, but also um, in our data. Are people with disabilities being included in the data? Uh, so this is all um, just bigger picture. Mm -hmm. You know, and one of the things that you mentioned, Monica, that I actually want to throw this to Rahini to start for a very specific reason. It also struck me that you were speaking about where is the education coming from as well, too. We talk about health literacy, and you were talking about it from a patient perspective. But for someone, Rohini, who just came through med school, like how much do you hear other intersection, other identities being taught within the system? Where, who are the teachers? Where's the information and the research they're, they're speaking about coming from? What would you say was your lived experience of that in your recent graduation from med school? Yeah, great question. So I will say there's not enough in the medical education space at all. When it comes to race and ethnicity, we don't really talk about the historical injustices that we've seen, the systemic racism and the implicit bias that we see in healthcare. It's not a part of our curriculum. Um, and I think medical professionals really should have this kind of training so that we can address these disparities effectively. Um, as for, for medical education should also include comprehensive training on gender affirming care, on addressing issues on reproductive health, hormone therapy, mental health support for everyone. And we don't do that. Uh, that was not something that we spoke about in my medical school. Um, and for, there's just so many different things for creating that inclusive healthcare environments where LGBTQ plus individuals and everyone feel safe and respected is just so important. And not having that kind of um, underlying medical education for all of the future healthcare providers, that that's that's really that's really sad. I mean, it involves training the providers, having cultural competency training, incorporating inclusive language and practices, and really also making sure that the medical student and the future physician understands that actively advocating for these policies and for everyone's rights in healthcare settings is so paramount and important and is just something that we don't speak enough about at all. Um, and when Leo is speaking about disability, ensuring that accessibility and accommodation for individuals with disabilities is fundamental, but we don't, again, do that at all. I, don't, I can't remember one conversation that we had in medical school about that. And this includes from physical accessibility to, to uh, facilities, from effective communication methods, adapting treatment plans, and we don't do that. Um, and that's something that I would, that's another passion uh, point for me to kind of reform that and have us talking about it a lot more. Can I add on that? Because I think that's a great answer. So I'm approaching this from uh, someone who as a professor taught classes in medical school. And because I'm a psychologist, I was, um, in the you know the area of more on this space with helping you know our the first year medical students had to take a rotation where they learned more about things like medical decision making and errors and and then some of these patient related factors and one thing that really struck me and so this is speaking to the need to change the culture of and the expectations of potential you know future physicians when they start medical school because so many of those students would say we just need to get through this all this soft stuff, and we want to get to the science. We, we want to get to the science. And they really did view it that way in the first, maybe it was the first nine weeks or so of medical school. And I think the, the school had the intention of trying to set the stage for these identity factors, these socioeconomic issues, the cultural factors to sensitize to them, sensitize them to these issues early in the process. But for many of the students, this was the part that they just didn't appreciate and wanted to get to what they refer to as like the science and, and actual the practice of medicine. And I, I, of course, was a bit disheartened by that and tried to help them understand that. But it reflected for me the need to have a cultural shift in the way that, you know, we think about this and, and maybe even start, you know, before medical school, undergraduates who are aspiring pre-med, you know, other things about it so that it, it might they may have a different attitude coming in. Just to add on, if that's okay, um, I, I think what you said is absolutely true. I think students do have that perspective, unfortunately, and don't realize how important it is, if not more important it is when you're interacting with your patients to learn about all of this. Um, but I, I think medical schools, I, and I can't speak for all medical schools, but at least in our school, 
we had a microaggressions um, session one, when a student introduced it. So students play a huge role in advocating for change in medical education. Um, and they put, they're very huge advocates for that. And hopefully that kind of, I'm hoping to see that shift in medical education uh, where students are speaking up more, we're having these kind of sessions, we're having these kind of discussions because that's the only way we can have that kind of change. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Lee, any perspective you would add to this? I don't think so. Not on this one. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I think we we're talking at this higher level in some ways, but if you could help our audience also understand either through lived experience or processes you've had in entering into this field or anecdotal information that you have, how does this actually show up in the healthcare space? Like what are moments that you know of where people are in the room with their care provider and this like comes into the space? I think it might be good just to give a more visceral understanding of what this might feel like actually in, in seeking healthcare. Anybody have anything they would be willing or open to share with? I couldn't start us out. I, okay. I'm sure we all have uh, something, but um We've seen health disparities in the organ transplant process. Um, people with marginalized identities are much less, multiply marginalized identities are even less likely to be put on even a pre-wait list for organ transplants. Uh, women with disabilities have lower rates of breast and cervical cancer screening compared with non-disabled women. Uh, Black and Latino adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities were more likely to report fair or poor physical and mental health compared with their white peers in a study. Um, these are just a couple of things that uh, you'll see. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good example. One that comes to mind for me is um, working with patients who are deaf or hearing impaired and ha and and witnessing the medical team, including the you know attending physician, speaking not to the patient, but speaking to the person who might be accompanying them to the to the visit. So dehumanizing them in a sense, um, and also not having appropriate interpreter services available, and making it really difficult to communicate for the patient themselves to be able to communicate. And I've I've noticed that even to a greater extent in health systems, federally qualified health centers, local community centers with fewer resources. So you see even fewer physicians who, and clinicians, nurses, medical staff, reception um, intake people who have any sense of how to manage someone who has um, you know, a hearing impairment or are deaf. And for me, when, because I'm so interested in OBGYN, that's the space that I've been mostly involved in during my medical school. And we know that there's maternal mortality, healthcare disparities. Um, Black women in the U.S. experience disproportionately high rates of maternal mortality compared to white women. And this disparity, it's not, it, it, that's something that we see. But another thing that I kept seeing in the OBGYN department is with pain management, especially during labor and delivery. And intersectionality plays such a significant role in this disparity. It and research has shown and evidence has shown that women from marginalized communities, low-income women or women of color are more likely to experience inadequate pain management during childbirth compared to you know, anyone else. And this was so many factors to that socioeconomic status, uh, access to healthcare facilities, to have who have appropriate pain management resources, the cultural beliefs, the implicit biases that come within the healthcare system. There's so many different things, but this is one that I think I feel like I see all the time um, in the OBGYN department, unfortunately. And there's just, it's this cumulative disadvantage um, from individuals who are in you know, multiple marginalized groups may experience all these compounded disadvantages in healthcare. Um, and it's just, talking about it is very important. Again, so we could shed light, we bring it to from the subconscious bias level to more of a understanding where your biases are and what to change. Mm -hmm. You know, and one of the things we know, at least in the LGBTQ community, is one of the biggest barriers to accessing healthcare is the previous negative experiences. So, especially in the trans wellness community, we find this often, especially for trans males who still, you know, have a vulva, still have a vagina, and they need treatment in an OBGYN setting, is they will often walk into that and be sensationalized for trying to do their own, their, their, their healthcare. 
And I think this is, you know, specifically to the LGBT community things we need to look at. I know for myself, whenever I'm meeting with a new medical team, um, one of the things I kind of have to do is I have to drop the word, oh, well, my husband's here. Um, as this little like temperature test in the room, it's like, okay, how did the doctor react to that? Did they react to that? Were they like welcoming to the conversation? Did they brush it off? And that's something I have to do in the room to test whether or not my queer identity is going to be respected in the room. Yeah, I think the same is absolutely true for disability and how um, a provider is going to respond to disability. I can respond personally um, to experiences of um, and as a disabled woman, but I know that there's hundreds of others of, um, you know, being misdiagnosed, being uh, misunderstood, not being believed, not um, all of these things are very real. Mm -hmm. And I want to make sure that our audience is aware too that we would love to hear any questions that are coming up for you, any thoughts or observations. Um, you can drop them into the Q&A and then we can open that up to our panel as well. Um, things have passed by in the chat, just um, Lisa was very interested in the point that medicine is science, but also understanding that people say it's a business um, and slash a customer focused business. So it is important that we have these conversations about understanding these aren't just, <clears throat> you know, scientific experiments that are coming into your room. These are real people with real needs and real issues and addressing the anxieties they may have in stepping into a clinic because of previous experience. Um, so if you were gonna look at the work you've been doing or some spaces that you're admiring right now, what are you noticing are some of the community responses and ways that are helping clinicians and clinics and centers to actually be more effective at addressing multiple marginalized communities? What are some things that you've been seeing out there? I'll start. Oh, no, go ahead, please, go ahead. No, no, please go for it. <laughs> I was gonna speak, I guess, to your question from the NIH and the research, biomedical research enterprise. And, and the things I've noticed over the past few years in particular, really starting in 2020 with like everything that happened with the pandemic and, and many things that people for the first time, you know, were really paying attention to. And there are a few things I think that people have focused on and are continuing to focus on. And I'm kind of delighted that here we are, you know, four years after the pandemic just about, and people are still talking about to, to, to some degree and thinking about the having, you know, the importance of healthcare systems, thinking about social determinants of health, collecting better data. As we talk about sexual orientation and gender identity, there's more of an effort to say we need to collect these data. We, if we don't ask, uh, we don't know. And um, thinking about standardized ways to do this. Also, you know, working in health systems, there's much more of an effort for policymakers, decision makers, and health systems to increase. Uh, efforts to collect and report disaggregated patient data on various populations, understanding that important disparities may be masked because either we did not collect the information or we asked it in such a way that does not allow for adequate disaggregation of those data. Uh, I think another thing I'm seeing is more of a mixed methodology as it relates to research, mixed methods, meaning qualitative and quantitative approaches, using them together for a more holistic analysis of some of these intersecting factors that influence health services access and outcomes. And so together with better data, researchers will be better able to analyze these intersections, looking at advantage and disadvantage in health access. And they'll be able to make better recommendations to deal with what we're talking about, which are structural and power dynamics in specific contexts. We are seeing, and it's much more emphasized, the importance of going beyond just the you know, immediate descriptive elements about social factors, for example, collecting age, sex, race, income, to really examine the policies, the political and the economic drivers of disadvantages, really looking more at the root causes of these things, which are much more difficult to measure and have not been measured traditionally um, in many disciplines. And I'm seeing a greater effort to think about how to do that 
and to focus on, you know, populations that experience health disparities, which for NIH purposes, those are designated as all racial and ethnic minority populations, sexual and gender minority groups, um, underserved rural populations, people with disabilities, and people who are disadvantaged economically, irrespective of any of the other characteristics. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Absolutely. Research is just so, so important because that same research we've been at AMSA, we've been doing this project looking at clinical algorithms in medicine. And there's a lot of racial disparity in clinical algorithms that we have. Um, and it comes from not having enough research um, done on, on those topics, but it also comes from not including um, all populations in these different research trials and these clinical trials, and then you get a very skewed clinical algorithm. Um, that's one thing. But another thing that, uh, you know, community, community leaders really can play such an important role in addressing and overcoming these challenges that we see that's associated with intersectionality in healthcare advocacy and awareness is just so important. Um, the intersectional nature of healthcare disparities and advocating for these policies and programs that address the unique needs of marginalized populations is important. Community engagement, making sure that we have diverse communities so that we are understanding these different barriers that they have to healthcare access and utilization is important. So community leaders can really help facilitate that dialogue um, and with community forums, et cetera, and gather input from, from their community and from their populations and kind of co-create that solution on what the needs are, what the challenges are and how to help address those. Um, and I think cultural competency training is re just really, really important, especially for future physicians, for physicians, uh, for, for healthcare providers, um, so that we're able to deliver that inclusive and equitable care to all diverse populations. Um, and policy advocacy, that's another one that's that um, um, Dr. Dr. Hooper also talked about, and that's just so important, advocating and expanding access to these healthcare services from affordable housing, transportation options, social supports, all of them that are very critical for addressing all the needs. Um, and really talking about social determinants of health as well, and because they, they do, and any initiatives that increases economic opportunity, improves educational opportunities, reduces food insecurity, all of those are important that we need to be talking about. And there's, yeah, I feel like this is a question that I can go on and on for, but a few of my thoughts. Uh, just to add on, I mean, going uh, third, means a lot of what I say is ditto to what they just said. Um, but to just add on a, a little bit, um, improved research, but also improved research to inform better policy, um, expanding access to home and community-based services, um, but also healthcare for everyone, making sure that everyone has access to health, healthcare and improved um, accessible transportation. Like the other, uh, other people said, like I could go on about this forever. <laughs> So I want to bring in some of the comments that are showing up in the um, chat and Q&A field. We had a lot of uh, interesting uh, comments coming up and some questions about them. One of them from Shelby really looks at exploring marginalized bodies and discrimination in healthcare. Um, anybody have any thoughts or input on that particular question? I could probably speak to that. Um... Yeah, I think there's the medical model model um, definitely, I think, marginalizes bodies to begin with. But um, the I, I guess I'm not exactly sure what the question is, but there is a, a relationship there. You're not making anything up about the the relationship between the medicalization of marginalized bodies and discrimination in healthcare. Like I think the more rare your body is, um, the more likely you are to experience that discrimination. And I think oftentimes um, to, to try to be fair to, to healthcare professionals, um, maybe they've only read about your body in a paragraph of a book or, um, and so they're curious, they're, um, but it doesn't come across that way when you're experiencing it as the person. Um, but I think also, um, I we often hear, you know, I I'm living this, so I'm actually more of the expert in this situation because I do know um, more about this rare condition or this um, 
situation than the medical professional. And I think that really flips the script a lot of times because so often it is that the medical professional knows more. And so, um, but when you have a rare condition and you have put all of these pieces together, you are often, um, you know, more of an expert. Um, and so I think that that is hard and that it often leads to discrimination. I don't know, I'd love to hear more about that question, uh, Shelby. The, what I'm the first thought that came to my mind um, for me was the historical medicalization of black bodies, especially in the context again of OBGYN. Um, black women's bodies were often subjected to very invasive medical procedures without their consent, and that has contributed to the devaluation and objectification of black lives. Um, and this kind of legacy of medical exploitation is also really perpetuated distrust and fear of the medical system among Black communities. And that's also led to disparities in, in healthcare outcomes. Uh, I went to Johns Hopkins for undergrad. And um, when we were in the community, people would say, I, I'm not, I would never want to go to Hopkins because Hopkins had a very uh, um, awful history of uh, doing research on Black people and not letting them know there was no consent at all. Um, and so they would say, if I go to Hopkins, I would probably not come back home. Um, and that's the kind of, you know, things that we, again, don't, you know, that's something that we need to not only talk about, but also how do we um, change our, our biases, change the way that our healthcare system is working so that we can foster that kind of trust in the medical system. Man, I can't tell. I see like a million thoughts running across your brain. <laughs> like, do you want to speak? Do you want to hold off on this one? The only thing I'll add, because I just I'm just taken by their examples, I'll just add that I think um, you know, in the in the medical textbooks, and when you think about the lack of diversity that you see in um the images, and so when people then are in a clinical setting and they're engaging with someone, they they can sometimes think that the body is different. Okay, I'll give you one point it quick example because I'm like, oh my goodness. Okay. I was conducting a tobacco cessation cognitive behavioral therapy group with people who were in a study who wanted to quit smoking. The room um, consisted of um, mostly white women, a few white men and one black woman. One of the white women who is a nurse says, well, as I'm talking about the damage that tobacco and smoking does to your lungs and how it turns your lungs black. And so this nurse says to the black woman, granted, I'm sitting there too, right? As the, one of the leads of the group. And she says, well, black people's lungs are already black. So it probably doesn't have that effect. Yeah, that was my reaction. And I had to keep it together because I'm the therapist in the situation. So I've learned to keep my face together, right? My face card, as they say. And, um, but that to me, is, and this was a nurse um, saying this. So I, it just... That's what I think about when I hear this kind of question. Mm -hmm. You know, and Michael brings up uh, another point that we didn't even like really draw into our, our you know, marginalized communities. And that is people who have been through the criminal justice system. Um, because once again, accessing care within the system itself and then being marginalized as you come out of that system, I think would be another huge barrier to either accessing care or trusting a system to provide that care. Agreed. At NIH, the National Institute on Drug Abuse is perhaps the institute, probably if I looked at their grant portfolio, who probably funds among the most in um, terms of research investment in persons who are involved in the criminal justice system, mostly because they cross that with substance use. And there are lots of disparities within that population in a number of ways. Um, so I think that there are people who are focused on addressing um, disparities among people who've been involved and who've ever been incarcerated, the healthcare that happens within uh, the time of incarceration, and then what happens um, when a person is not within the system. So there, there is a need, I agree with Michael's comment, for analysis of those individuals and to understand more about those disparities and how to address them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
And one of the things that Dustin brought in that I think is another important piece of the puzzle right now is we are seeing this movement towards anti-DEI, you know, kind of moving through the system. You know, we had all these really great pieces of growth and development and starting to learn respect and have deeper conversations. And now we're seeing this huge pushback against it. And I'm wondering how you're seeing that's influencing the experience of communities, but also the systems that are trying to provide care. Great, I think that's a great question. I'll start. So there are you know, about 27 states, my number might be a little bit off, so give or take a couple, that have introduced anti-DEI legislation. And um, I think nine states have successfully passed anti-DEI legislation. There are a number that are still pending and a few that have not gone forth yet, but I think we'll be coming back to the, the House floors in those states. And so we really have to be mindful of this. At NIH, we, you know, I think of DEI as reflecting workforce kinds of issues. Who's in the workforce? Are there equitable opportunities to enter and thrive in a particular, you, you know, STEM field, for example, since we're talking about medicine and healthcare. So, you know, my reaction is, at, at least at NIH, we've not funded projects, for example, that are simply based on, you know, something related to affirmative action. And I don't think many fields have. I think that a, it's a total myth that people are getting into school or getting a job just because they're this thing, this person, and, and meaning that they have zero qualifications other than that. That's never been the case. And as a matter of fact, I was always taught that you have to work twice as hard, three times as hard to even be seen. So we're getting really the most qualified people who are in these positions. And, and I think we have to recognize that and we have to stay on top of it. And that notion though, and, and the, what I see Dustin added in here um, from Missouri, that is the same type of sentiment that I was seeing years ago in working with medical students. So, you know, there is a risk that, you know, we're going, we saw the pendulum kind of swing in one direction towards, you know, being pro DEI. And then now uh, we're sort of seeing it swiftly swing in the other direction. And so we'll, you know, those of us who really are committed to understanding the excellence that DEI efforts bring to tables have to advocate, speak loudly, and do what we can within our own domains of influence to have a positive impact. And honestly, it just, it irks me so much. Uh, irk is probably a very small word to irk use. Irk is a very gentle I, word you're using right very now. Very gentle you. word. I mean, I have a lot of choice <laughs> words, but anti-DEI sentiments is just, it upholds discriminatory beliefs and attitudes. There's really nothing else to say about that. It leads to unequal treatment and marginalization of individuals. It limits access to care. Um, it results in policies like it already has and practices that restricts access to all of these services for, for communities of people. It perpetuates health inequity, inequities. Um, it, it, it's, it undermines any efforts to determine, to address these systemic inequities that we see. It creates unsafe environments. Uh, it's unwelcoming for patients and healthcare providers. And it again leads to mistrust, it, avoidance of healthcare services, negative health outcomes uh, due to either delayed or inadequate care. It, it just, it's, it's a very significant challenge that we're in. And it, it all the efforts that we've done to create these equitable, inclusive and culturally competent healthcare systems. When I hear of the anti high um, kind of things that are happening, it just, it's, yeah, it's preposterous. Mm -hmm. oh, preposterous. I like that language. <laughs> we'll talk afterwards. I want to hear the rest of the language. <laughs> Leah, you had some thoughts too. Oh, no, I was just going to say I can't help, but um, what's that quote that uh, equity is not pie, like there's enough for everyone. Um, and it it's not, um, you know, you're still going to get some of yours, uh, just because there's going to be enough for everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and I want to just kind of turn us just a tiny bit now towards, well, we've got a lot of people who are clinicians. We've got a lot of people who are leading organizations. We have people who have the ability to try and open up and make change in their communities. What do you imagine are some, some ways they could either bring cultural humility into their system itself 
or create spaces that are more welcoming to our community members. You know, Ashley had a really beautiful point, you know, about the difficulties for transgender, intersex, and non-binary patients getting OBGYN clinics, and that most of them are called women's health centers. And so I think right there is one of those moments of like, well, what can we do on a really basic human to human level in that healthcare setting, in these agencies, in these healthcare centers to try and make some just initial change start to happen? What might some of your suggestions be? I'll jump in. Um, I mean, I, I think just being human and just like, what does kindness look like and what does um, empathy look like? And I mean, in my own experience, um, when something wasn't accessible, if someone just tried, like that um, made a huge change in how I experienced my my healthcare. So um, I, I would say this is a, a basic humanity and kindness. I don't know if that's a a systemic, <laughs> if we could make that a, a systemic, but yeah. Well, no, I think it's it's addressing that more individualized, what, what can I do as a person working with patients right now, leading a center, like that much more humanized level of conversation, yeah. It, I, I agree to what Leo's saying, and it starts from self, really, I think, before going to that that systemic level but also having leadership that has a very clear commitment to DEI um, and integrating that into organization, institution, school, mission, values, strategic priorities, that's, that's a huge way of creating that kind of change and having clear DEI goals, uh, right? So there's clear measurable DEI goals and objectives uh, that people are following through. There's DEI policies and practice, practices that promote uh, DEI throughout the organization, um, from hiring practices to training and development and creating protocols, community engagement initiatives, all of that can play a role. And another thing is education and training. So making sure that we're talking to, from employees to students, to everyone at all, all levels of the organization um, on unconscious bias, inclusive communication, understanding the social determinants of health, all of this would be important. Um, and I think including everybody, the reason why we want DEI and have diverse group of people coming together is because lived experiences are so different and we want to be able to understand them so that we may provide the most inclusive and best patient-centered care that we possibly can. And that only happens when we are listening to everybody. Um, and yeah, I'm, I think another big thing is just monitoring and evaluating your progress as we go on um, so that we are going towards our goals and objectives and reviewing data on uh, whether our workforce, our students, uh, there is a diverse uh, group of people who are in, in uh, as students or in as employees and that looking at your patient outcomes, is there any differences that you see, racial disparities or any other disparities that you see? Um, and those things are just important for us to just keep evaluating whether we're doing the right thing or not. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to add a quick thought here as well, too. And <clears throat> those of you who attended our out, out care chats before know that this is a common theme for me, is that these types of efforts and trainings can't just be a one and done situation. They need to be an ongoing conversation with communities that you're providing care for to learn how the community is changing and growing, to learn from lived experience, to be willing to commit to bringing that in as an ongoing part of the conversation, not just a, we did this one training and look at us, now we're gonna put something out that says we are this particular person. And I think that can be a really dangerous thing for organizations to do and for the individuals who are coming to try and trust those organizations, seeing that they're saying they have provided this training to their staff when it's only been a one-time thing rather than a systemic change. Um, I have a very strong opinion on that. <laughs> you know, and I, I think that, so training is an interesting one, right? Because there's a lot of, we can train people all day, but it's kind of like what Leah said, there, there has to be a human element to it um, because you can teach them about bias and they can hear about microaggressions, but they can easily think that's not me. I don't have that problem. I see, you know, I don't see color. I don't see, you know, a, a person that's different from me physically or in any other way. 
Um, but that's not reality because we all have biases that just are there and we have to address. So I used to teach cultural diversity courses for um, medical students and also for people becoming psychologists. And one important element of the training that I, I often see missing is the experiential component of it. So one of the things that can help there's two things I think that really help with these kinds of training. One is it has to be optional. And many times, you know, when, when it's a requirement um, in an environment, you have that kind of psychological reactance. People feel like their autonomy is threatened and they don't, they kind of shut down a little bit. So it should sort of be optional, but encouraged with some sort of incentive or carrot for them to want to participate. I think the other piece is people don't really want to be preached at. Even if they, you know, they kind of know these things a little bit, they don't want to be preached at. So there has to be that experiential component. So as one example, I would um, require as an assignment, and I, because I agree with you, John, it's not a one-off. It's kind of, we're going to come back and keep working on this, but it was an immersion experience. So they had to put themselves in an immersive experience in an environment with a cultural group that was vastly different from their own places that they never would normally find themselves. So people, for example, went to a religious service from, uh, you know, from another group. They went to the LGBT center and attended some events. They, you know, they engaged in activities. They went to Shabbat dinner. They did all kinds of things that they would not normally do. And 100% of the time, and I did this with probably a few, several hundred students over time, 100% of the time people came back and said, that was a really great experience. People welcomed me. I felt engaged. I learned a lot. I would do that again. And some continued. They made connections that they would have not made otherwise. So those exposures and positive experiences, because I think, you know, when people don't have exposure to different people, they just know what they see on TV or what they read on social media, which is going to be totally toxic. Mm -hmm. And just grabbing hold of that thought as well, too. We've talked quite a bit about biases that exist within each of us. And I think it's so important in these processes of learning and growing to understand what our biases are and what are those biases are doing to influence us from actually even being willing to step into the environment or to get the education. Um, I think that for me is an ongoing piece of personal work that will probably be a lifetime process for me. Because every time I think I've gotten to the bottom of the bias, well, guess what? I discover another one in there. And so for me, it's also an ongoing process in my growth and development. And I would encourage that all of our clinicians to be willing to sit down with yourself and honestly assess where are those places where I'm suddenly feeling my anxiety rise? Why am I having a certain reactivity when this type of client walks into the room, patient walks into the room? Why is it hard for me to hear some of these conversations such as we're having today? What are my biases, my buttons that are being pushed in this and be willing to honestly assess that and try and see how you could move beyond that. I think that's an important piece of this puzzle as well too. So we have a lot of uh, conversation going on in the background here as well too. Um, some questions about looking at that, and you've all mentioned this on a really deep level, and Ramona, I really want to honor this, is that all of our panelists have understood and identified that yes, the system has to be shaken up from the ground up. Um, we are we are just on the tip of a very, we're, we're so on the tip of this iceberg by just having this conversation today. And it is, this is a systemic piece of the puzzle that does have to be shaken up. And each of us can choose to commit how we're going to be one of those movers and shakers in this process. And I think it's important for all of us to really own that idea that it is systemic and not shy away from that. So we're getting close to time for today. And one of the things that I always like to close with is a question for each of you to really contemplate. If we look at this subject and how we would like it most to come to be like your hope and vision for the future that would address all of the things we've talked about. So if you look inside your heart, your space, your spirit, what is your hope and vision for the future of care for marginalized communities? I think about this a lot because for the reasons that Ramona mentions and, and other really important comments that have been made, both by the audience and my co-panelists, 
you know, I do the work that I do every day of trying to improve the health of, you know, various minoritized populations, as well as people that experience health disparities. And it's very easy to um, become discouraged because you don't see the progress that you'd like to see. And there has not been as, as much as we need. The reason that I continue to do this work, though, is because I do have hope for, I think, just the future of health equity in our system. And health equity is not a specific outcome, like we achieved it and we're there, we're done. It's this constant assurance that fully embraces and understands concepts like intersectionality, leading to personalized, inclusive care for every individual, giving them that aspirational goal of, of being able to optimize their health. And I, I think, you know, we have to challenge medical cultural norms. We have to challenge the system inequities that they produce and reproduce. And we do have to start, I think, in part with rejecting this idea that one system of inequality is more important than any other. This is not the oppression Olympics. Um, different inequities are intertwined and experienced simultaneously. So, you know, my hope is that we can continue to focus and really get real on dis dismantling these various barriers to healthcare that have been written about and spoken about so eloquently that we are ensuring that healthcare professionals are trained better and with better cultural competence, that we make that a requirement, you know, some measurable way to require, just like we're gonna test them in organic chemistry, we need to test them and make sure that we're seeing that in multiple ways, not just on the test, but what are we seeing clinically? And that we continue to prioritize the voices and the needs of various populations who experience healthcare in decision-making. And ultimately that my hope is that we just have this world where everybody, so it's so aspirational, right? But regardless of their intersecting identities, just have equitable access to high quality care. Like we just deserve it. And I think starting from a place, don't you think everyone deserves high quality care and a, and a good life? If you can start with yes there, then we have something to talk about. I, I love it. I, every single thing, yes, yes, yes. Um, and also as a recent medical school graduate, it's something for me personally, is to always continue to educate myself so that I could become that uh, physician that I've always wanted to, you know, um, that I've always looked looked up to. Um, and my hope and vision for the future, I think, is really centered around uh, creating a healthcare system that prioritizes health equity, inclusivity, accessibility for all individuals, um, that diversity and inclusion are va valued, um, that intersectionality is acknowledged, um, and that patient-centered care is just the standard. Um, and preventative care is emphasized and that we have collaboration and advocacy in all of these different areas um, and beyond. Um, and yeah. I couldn't agree more. Um, for me, uh, my vision, my hope for the future is one that's more accessible for everyone. Um, that means healthcare, health insurance, home and community-based services, uh, food, transportation, housing, um, that's affordable, accessible, and integrated. Um, that's my hope for the future. And Leah, the quote over your right shoulder <laughs> is beautiful to have with us today during this entire conversation. And the, what the quote says is, well-behaved women rarely make history. And I think that can also include every bit of the conversation we've been having today. So I want to thank all of you so much for bringing your wisdom, your lived experience, your, your passion, your spirit to this conversation today. And I've been honored to be able to sit in this space with you. Um, for those of you who want to join us next month, we're going to be stepping up and we're going to be looking at what we're calling kind of unmasking those corporate strategies for supporting LGBTQIA plus communities. We talked once about a concept of pride washing, and we want to explore outside of Pride Month, how is the healthcare industry actually addressing the needs of the LGBTQ community? So if you'd like to join us, it will be on Thursday, March 21st, 6 p.m. Eastern time, 3 p.m. West Coast time. And you can sign up at Alcar Health slash Outtalk. And you can also see this episode. It'll probably be up uh, next week. And you can see other episodes that we have brought into our past conversations. Once again, thank you all so much for sharing your wisdom with us today. Thank you for having me. Enjoyed the conversation.